There's trouble in Israel. As Dr. J. Vernon McGee describes it, it's a time of great heartache and great heartbreak for God's people. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus for another exciting journey in God's Word. We're traveling through chapters 4 and 5 of the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, where we see more of the greatness and humanity of God's man, David. For those of you who have been on the Bible bus for a while, you know that Dr. McGee didn't like high-pressure fundraising tactics. But from time to time, he did remind us that this ministry continues today in over 200 languages around the world because God's grace and the quiet and faithful generosity of listeners like you. In fact, he believed wholeheartedly that if God wanted through the Bible to continue, he would provide through his people. Here's Dr. McGee now. It has been our policy from the very beginning, and that's 1941, when we began broadcasting the program that's eventuated into the one now called Through the Bible in five years. And that policy we adopted then was not to spend time begging or asking people for support, but just to tell our policy from time to time. And it's probably time for me to say just a word about it. And it's very brief. We depend upon the listeners in any station except the foreign broadcast to support the program. If a certain area does not support the station and our program, why we move on to another station. We found that that's been the best policy. We'd give a warning each time to see if some folk have just been negligent and hadn't got around to supporting the program. So I trust you'll understand that we do not spend time asking for support. We're just as dependent as any program on the support of listeners. And we believe that where you get your blessing, that's where you ought to support. And if it's a blessing to you, it may be a blessing to others also. Remember, you can partner with Through the Bible in bringing God's Word to your community and around the world by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE or mailing your gift to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Or you can visit us online at ttb.org forward slash give. And ttb.org is also the place, by the way, to download your free copy of Dr. McGee's Notes and Outlines that he'll mention in just a moment. Now, before we begin, I want to share a couple of letters from listeners in Kazakhstan. I'm 24 years old, the first one says, and accepted Jesus as my Savior a couple of years ago. Because there are no churches in my area and my family was against my new faith, I gave up. Recently, I met a woman who showed me how to install your app on my phone. I'm so grateful to know more about Jesus and have recommitted my life to him. And then another Kazakhstani listener wrote this. At the age of 19, I watched my older brother drown. I tried to save him, but I was too late. Through this heartbreak, I began to question the meaning of life. Finding no answer, I turned to alcohol to numb my sadness. A few years later, an elderly woman invited me to a Christian church and to listen to your program. This changed my life. I no longer had the need of alcohol. Unfortunately, at that time, I was a scholarship student at a conservatory. When they found out I was a Christian, they no longer allowed me to attend. In the end, God had greater plans. I'm now a pastor and rejoice that I have the opportunity to share God's word with others. Please pray for the lost in Kazakhstan. There are so many who live in darkness. Man, isn't that an encouraging couple of letters? Well, if you're not already on the World Prayer Team, you need to join us today. Go to ttb.org forward slash pray and get stories like this, testimonies of how God is using his word to change people's lives. Get them into your email every day, Monday through Friday, and you can pray with us all around the world. Let's do that now. Father, help us to learn from the life of David, from what made him great and what made him weak. And then would you show us how we too can become people after your own heart? We want that so badly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we come back to the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Samuel. And we're dealing with troubled times for the nation Israel. It was a time 
of internal strife, civil war, after the death of Saul and Jonathan. And it was a time of great heartache and heartbreak for God's people. And we'll be getting into this chapter 4 in just a moment, but I do want to urge you to write in and ask for notes and outlines if you do not have them, and follow along in this study. This is a section of the Word of God that's usually passed over, but it's given to us, I'm confident, for two reasons. To show us the family of the Lord Jesus, to give us his genealogy. And the second reason is that we're told, Paul tells us, all these things happened unto them for examples unto us for a very definite reason, and they have been given to us in order that they might minister to us in a spiritual way. And that's what we're anxious to note here. Now we saw last time that there had been a rebellion against David. He'd been made king of the tribe of Judah. He'd moved into Hebron, just at the edge of the kingdom and in the south, and he was there. And that Abner had led a rebellion by putting a son of Saul on the throne, ish But because this young king reprimanded him and rebuked him because of his position, relative to taking a concubine of Saul, why Abner then went over to David. And he made a big mistake there because there was a man over there by the name of Joab, and he was waiting for revenge, for Abner had killed his brother, and he lured him out of Hebron, the city of refuge. If Abner had only stayed there, he'd have been safe, but he was lured out by Joab, and then Joab slew him. And we saw last time that David gave the strangest epitaph that any person could have. Died Abner as a fool died. Why? Well, he left the city of refuge. He had salvation, and he wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't receive it, and he moved out. How many people today are dying like that? God's offered a salvation. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, now you have to believe in him. God loves you, but you will have to accept Christ if you're to be saved because he goes on to say, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I think this is God's viewpoint. God says a man's a fool today that a die without Christ. That is the position of God, not mine. I'm not saying that to you, but that's what God says to you, and I don't care who you are because this is the position of the lost today who will not turn to Christ, and all of us are lost until we do turn to him. Now, you will notice as we come here to this fourth chapter that this young man, ish now has lost his captain, the military, and he knows he cannot maintain his kingdom against David without the military. And his captain has been murdered. And beside that, he'd already gone over to David. And so what he's to do? In chapter 4, I begin reading at verse 1. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Baana. The name of the other was Rechab. The sons of Remon, a Berathite, of the children of Benjamin. For Berath also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Berathites fled to Gitam and were sojourners there until this day. That is, until the time that Second Samuel was written. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old. When the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, his nurse took him up and fled. came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now, that's an unusual name, but you remember it, will you? Because in a few days now, I'll be coming to Mephibosheth. And here is one of the most beautiful stories that was ever told about David. Now, you see, Mephibosheth, as long as he lived, was a constant danger to David because he had throne right. 
Davids. He was the son of Jonathan. But since he was the son of Jonathan, David would never harm a hair on his head. And later on, David will go looking for members of the family of Saul and Jonathan, not to slay them, but to show kindness to them, to reveal that he actually loved them and did not hate them at all. So the thing that will happen will be just simply this, that he will finally locate Mephibosheth. And everyone expected him to slay him, but he brought that crippled boy into the palace, put him at his own table, and he ate there, and he told him, said, you'll have free board and lodging the rest of your life. And he protected this young man the rest of his life. May I say to you, this is an act on the part of David for which he should be commended. It's so easy to criticize David. And I think we need to recognize the one who criticized him the most was the Lord. The Lord judged him, friends. But David had many very wonderful traits. This was one of them. Now, in that, we'll see a great spiritual lesson. You and I have been showed kindness because of another. You see, David loved Jonathan, and it's for Jonathan's sake that he exercised kindness. You and I have been crippled by sin. He covers us with his righteousness, and because of another, because of what Christ did for us, God accepts us and receives us. What a beautiful picture we have here. I call your attention to it because we'll be coming to it later on. But now we follow this story, and it's not a beautiful story by any means. This was a great period of crisis. It was the transition from the kingdom of Saul to the kingdom of David. There had been civil war. There had been rebellion, you see, during this period. Now when these two underlings who were petty officers under Abner in the army of Saul discovered that Abner was dead, and they recognized the strength and the power of David at this particular time, they conspired to put this boy, who is a son of Saul, to death. And they made a big mistake, by the way, in doing that. And so when Ishbosheth was in bed, why they slipped upon him and they slew him. And it was a bloody, ugly thing. Now they expected by doing that, that they could make peace with David and that David would actually reward them for this. And so they immediately took the head, imagine that, of this boy over to David. Well, David was not even about to accept it, friends. He would not in any way approve of that. In fact, these men had committed a murder, and they had murdered a king, and he executed them summarily for doing this dastardly deed. David now is king over the land. He exercises that authority. But yet the 10 tribes, or actually it's really the 11 tribes, because at this particular time, even the tribe of Benjamin, which later went with Judah, this tribe was the tribe out of which Saul came. They were with the tribes in the north. And so actually it was 11 tribes against one. Now those in the north recognize they no longer have any leadership. And there's no one to assume authority. And this foolish to carry on this rebellion at this time against David. And so they now attempt to make overtures for peace. And notice how they do it. And that brings me here to chapter 5. And notice this. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David under Hebron. That is, they sent representatives, of course, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And that was true. And that's the thing that made this civil war as terrible as it was, because those people were fighting among themselves. I personally think the greatest and worst war that this country fought was the Civil War. I think that as you look back at it today, it was almost something that was unnecessary. It was the hotheads, the protesters in that day that got this country in trouble. And that's the reason I'm opposed to all hot-headed protesters. I don't care what side they're on today, because that's the crowd that got this nation in trouble way back yonder. It was not the man who actually fought the war like General Grant and Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee. They found themselves in an awkward situation. And you can still see the vestige in the carryover of that war 
that was fought actually over a hundred years ago, and yet the scars are still here. And so this was a great civil war that had been carried on. Now that nation is to be united under David and to enter the greatest period that this nation has ever enjoyed in the past, and it'll be typical of the day that Christ comes and rules. Now will you notice what we have here? All the tribes now come to David through their representatives. Listen to verse 2. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, thou shalt be a captain over Israel. Well, they are rather late in getting around to acknowledge that David was the legitimate and the right ruler over these people. And they should have recognized this before, but belatedly they've got around to it now, and they recognize him. So that all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now this nation is ready to enter its greatest period of prosperity and expansion. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah, which actually means he reigned 40 years and six months. Now notice the first move that David does to consolidate the kingdom. He moves the capital from Hebron up to Jerusalem. Verse 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. They underestimated David again. David was a great military leader and a great leader politically and a great king and most of all and best of all, he was a real man of God. Now notice this. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Mark that in your Bible. I've marked that in my Bible, and you know why? Zion was David's favorite spot. The city of Zion is the city of David. And if you've ever been to that land and to the city of Jerusalem, you'll recognize that it is the high point of the city. Actually, in David's day, Jerusalem was way down near the valley of Kidron. They have found the walls that went around that particular city at that particular time. And it's way down below. Actually, the present city of Jerusalem is up near Mount Zion. And yet it's in the Israel side, actually. And it's not a part of the old city. Here's where the palace of David was built. And later on, below him, that's where the temple was to be built. David chose all of this. Now, Zion and Jerusalem was David's city. He has many psalms that tell us about Jerusalem. And very frankly, it wouldn't be my favorite city. I agree with David on many things, but not on Jerusalem. Pilate hated this city and he only came up there during the feast days. That's the reason he happened to be there at the Passover when the Lord Jesus was arrested. He was there to keep order. And when it was over, he retired to Caesarea because he loved it down there on the Mediterranean. And I'll be very frank with you, I think I would much prefer that than Jerusalem. But as far as the Bible is concerned, Jerusalem is yet to be the great capital of this earth. And I'm delighted to know that I'll not be living there in eternity. I'm going to be in the new Jerusalem, and it has a much greater vantage point than the earthly Jerusalem. But we need to note here, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David, you see. What he did, he moved and took the top of the hill, and not the city proper. And from that vantage point, he was able to take this city of the Jebusites, and they found themselves overwhelmed before they even knew that there was a battle going on. Now we read here, verse 8, And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites, 
And the lame and the blind that are hated of David, so he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Now, David here is doing something that apparently is the result of his years of out yonder roughing it. And David was a rough and ready individual, by the way. Now, keep in mind, God would never let him build the temple. So don't become too critical because God is the one who judged him. And we need to remember even believers should recognize this one of another. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or fall. And I have no right to sit in judgment over you. You have no right to sit in judgment over me. And I am going to have to stand before God as a believer my works will be tested, and yours will too, my beloved. Not for salvation, to see whether you're going to receive a reward or not. Now, since I'm his servant, and you're his servant, then I'm not your servant, and you're not mine. Therefore, we're not to judge each other on that basis, you see. Now, let's not judge David, because God already judged him. And I want to tell you, God took him to the woodshed and gave him a good whipping. We're going to see that. Now we are told in verse 9, So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. That was Mount Zion. And David built round about for a mile and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram king of Tyre sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons. And they built David a house. Now you see when he moved up there, took the city, why he now has a wonderful friend in the man up there in the north, and that was Hiram, king of Tyre. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And Hiram recognized that David was an outstanding man, so he worked out with him an arrangement whereby he supplied materials and workmen to build him a palace. And we're told, verse 13, and David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there was yet sons and daughters born to David. Now, that is the record of the facts. It's not God's approval because it's here. We'll find out it was definitely God's disapproval, and in his son Solomon, it eventuated in the splitting of the kingdom today and finally really brought on the Babylonian captivity. Why? Because this man is king. He's in a place of leadership. And this is wrong. Well, who says it's wrong? God says it's wrong. And after all, this is his universe. He makes the rules. If you don't like them, well, I don't know about you, but most of the rules of God are pretty good. The fact that God today has put us on a universe and he sticks us on here with scotch tape. We today have another name for it, but it is one of the laws of God that you're going to just be helped to this earth and you can't get very far away from it. It'll pull you right back down. And that's a law of God, by the way. He has some good rules and regulations. And after all, he made it. It's his universe. Now, will you note here that we find something that we need to note in particular? And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shemua and Shobab. Now, I know nothing about those two boys and Nathan and Solomon, but I do know something about them. From the line of Nathan came Mary, the mother of Jesus. From Solomon came Joseph, and from both of them, the Lord Jesus got the bloodline and the legal title to the throne of David through Nathan and Solomon. And that's the reason that it's recorded here for us. Now we find that David carries on here in a monotonous sort of way, this war with the Philistines. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. And we find here that there was war between David and the Philistines. Never was there peace in this enemy. Next time we're going to see David bringing up the ark, and that's a case of doing the right thing in the wrong way. We'll see that next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, things sure are getting interesting in Israel, aren't they? 
Hop aboard next time as we learn more about David. In the meantime, go deeper in your study of God's Word by getting our monthly newsletter. Sign up for our mailing list by visiting ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, as always, asking God to bless you as you walk with Him today. Our study today was made possible through your prayer and financial support. We'll meet you back here next time. In fact, we're going to do this together, Lord willing, till Jesus comes again. In which case, we'll meet you in the air.